Good afternoon and welcome to Concordia Theological Seminary, Fort Wayne. I am Dr. John Nordling, Professor of Exegetical Theology in New Testament, and I'm very pleased to take you through the uh, epistle lesson for Proper 12b, which is Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. Uh, let us begin with the collect of the day, we pray. Almighty and most merciful God, the protector of all who trust in you, strengthen our faith and give us courage to believe that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. So, um, again, I um, checked, uh, like I've been saying all along with these epistle lessons, I've noticed that the collect of the day doesn't really fit completely with them. It happens that the gospel lesson for this proper is Mark 6, 45 to 56, which is Jesus walking on the water, the stilling of the storm, and then the healing of the sick in Gennesaret. Um, so this collect really fits that idea, the protector of all who trust in you and courage to believe uh, that in your love you will rescue us from all adversities. I mean, that definitely happens in the gospel lesson. Um, there may be a connection just slightly with this strengthen idea because uh, 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 twice... Um, uh, strength is mentioned in the epistle lesson, I noticed. So, but that's really the only connection that I can see to the collect of the day. Let's then look at the text, um, which is Ephesians chapter 3, 14 to 21, uh, which is a little bit easier than that one that we had from... <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, that very long periodic sentence that didn't come up to breathe air. This one is, is about half as long, so uh, easier for that reason. So anyway, Paul says here, Tuto karen kampo tagnomata mu proston patera. So for this reason, and you have this, this tutu karen it's a prepositional phrase. Um, sometimes in Greek and in Latin, um, prepositions will follow the, the noun head, and that's what happens here. Uh, so Karen takes the genitive here for this reason. And Paul has been uh, talking uh, 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 grand eloquently, and, and it's kind of like he's getting back to what he was saying before, kind of a diversion of 10 or 12 verses. Um, Paul then assumes the posture of prayer. Kampto tagona tamu, I bend my knees, okay, uh, toward the Father, proston patera. Um, so this is one of the postures of prayer, of uh, the bending of the knee, and uh, Winger in his commentary has kind of a, a, of a ex, uh, extended passage about whether this would include prostration or not. He doesn't think it does because of the mention of the hands being raised. And so, but at any rate, um, check Winger's commentary for other places where that expression is used. Um, unto the Father. So this would, of course, be God the Father. Um, from whom? Now, we would like this to be by whom, uh, but it says from whom or out of whom. Uh, Pasa patria en uranois kai epigeis onam mads etai. From whom every um, patria. Now this threw me for a loop because I read Latin. Patria means fatherland in Latin, but in Greek, as I discovered today, it means family, something like that, or 
fa family, um, in, both in heaven and on earth, are named. So you have this, this glorious kind of image of, of God the Father. Now again, um, Winger doesn't really go here. Winger's commentary is very full and has much great stuff to learn from. Um, but what this made me think of would be someone like Lord Zeus or Jupiter, you know, the king of the gods in the Roman pantheon, Ephesus being a Roman city. Um, and again, if that's the case, Paul could be taking this pagan language over and investing it now with Christian significance and saying uh, that um, every uh, uh, family on earth is named from God the Father, taking us back to creation, the creation of Adam and Eve. And uh, that's who all people's true father is. It all goes back to God the Father, whether pagans know this or not, okay? In heaven and on earth, okay? So you have this, this glorious, all-encompassing um, type of language that you would expect in liturgy, and we, we definitely have liturgical uh, nomenclature that's used in this letter. In he, uh, th this is interesting. Uh, Paul says, en uranois, and that phrase occurs several times in, um, in Ephesians, and sometimes I think it's best to just take that as in the heavenlies. Uh, 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 and then on earth, epigeis, and that always makes me think, of course, of the Lord's Prayer, right? Uh, 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 our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done in heaven as well as on earth, Epi, epigeis. So I don't know if you can really prove that, but that's what, make, that's what comes to the mind uh, is named, okay? Uh, now, we have then, um, let's put that away, clear that out. And now we have some nice grammar. Uh, we have a henna clause and an aorist subjunctive, henna do, okay? And then later on, we're gonna have another henna down here, okay, just to orient you. And then we have a, an aorist subjunctive there, okay? So again, uh, typically pastors say purpose. It's gotta be purpose, henna plus the subjunctive. Well, not so fast, okay? Um, uh, I, um, it could be uh, Paul's prayer, okay? I, I, I bend my knees before God the Father that he grant to us according to the wealth of his glory uh, by means of his power that we be strengthened, okay? That he grant you, right? It could be, in other words, not a purpose clause, but a... Uh, a content clause, a kind of a prayer clause, um, a, a version of which is sometimes called in Latin the justive noun clause or indirect command, um, a, a, associated with the verb of commanding or praying. So that may well be what we have here. Um, the, the aura of praying in liturgy is never far from this text. Okay, and so... Um, as you handle this homiletically, one of the things you can probably mention to your people is that we learn to pray from a text like this. We learn to pray as Paul prayed in, in his uh, writing for the Ephesians. Okay, so back to this. In order that he grant to you in accordance with the wealth of his glory... Whose glory? I'm assuming it, it's either going to be Christ's glory or God the Father's glory. It's a bit indeterminate. Um, uh, to be strengthened with power, duname, dative of means or instrument. It's an adverbial construction. Uh, to be strengthened, kratai othenai. Remember I said there was a kind of tie here maybe with the collect of the day uh, to be strengthened. Um, through 
his spirit, dia tu noimatus auto, for the esso anthropon, for the inner man, ton esso anthropon. Um, uh, that part of us, that would be as opposed to the old man, the new man and the old man, the outer man that is uh, subject to sin and weakness, and then the inner man, the part that is taken over by the spirit and has uh, Christ's gifts at, at, at its behest. Um, so Paul has that idea here. Again, uh, this is a phrase that occurs. It's, I know it's in Romans as well, and probably in Corinthians too. But um, I would, uh, again, if you, can, if you can look at Moulton and Gedon's Concordance of the Greek Testament, that phrase will stand out. That's one that you can track through the epistles and see how Paul uses it. Uh, then, it then we have, uh, so we had a hina and an aorist subjunctive here. Now we have kind of what would be called a prolate infinitive here, kat, kat oi kesai ton kriston. Ton kriston is an accusative, and that's going to be the subject of this, um, so I put an S over that, the subject of this infinitive, that Christ may dwell through, through faith in your hearts. So this would then kind of continue Paul's prayer, okay, if it's a prolate infinitive. And uh, it's a bit um, mushy. Um, that's the way true Greek really is. Uh, that's the way Paul's epistolary Greek is. You have to kind of add some spice and some elbow grease sometimes to see how it fits together. But this passage is much easier than that one from two weeks ago that you labored with uh, for me there. Um, it, it, it falls together quite nicely and clearly. But so the idea is again good. Uh, again, uh, you, could, you could, I think, preach on this by just uh, subdividing these, these petitions that he grant you to be strengthened, that Christ may dwell through faith. So here's a classic case of the uh, dia tes pisteos. This would be the fides qua creditur, the faith by which one believes, uh, the subjective faith, my faith in Christ, um, uh, that Christ may dwell through faith in your hearts, uh, in your hearts before he was talking about the inner man. Um, and then he goes on again, uh, in agape eridzomenoi kai tethemeliomenoi. Okay, now suddenly, if you're careful, you'll see that the case changes here, which we don't like. Uh, suddenly, it becomes nominative, masculine, plural. Wait a minute. You know, what happened to uh, this genitive here? Um, why is Paul monkeying around with the cases? Well, again, it's an extended expression, and that's the way Greek, I think Paul loses track. You know, that, that it really shouldn't go that way, but it does. And it's, uh, you would call this an odd sensum construction. It makes perfect sense in context. And it's really not that difficult to see. Um, uh, rooted and grounded in love. Okay. Um, uh, so this again is talking about our connection that we have um, in love. Uh, not, I would say, the emotion of love, but how about a passage like John 3.16, for God so loved the world, that love, that agape, God's love in Christ, is certainly what's meant by that in agape there. Uh, and then we have another one of these henna constructions, um, uh, in order that ye might be strengthened or may have ability, ex ex iscusete to, um, to gather kata labestai with all the saints. And then, and then we have the, the, um, the object, ti ta platas kai mekas kai hupsos kai bathos. What is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of what? 
you'd like there to be a genitive case there, and there isn't, of course. So again, um, again, it's quite clear that, talk, that, that Paul is talking about the great abundance that there is in Christ Jesus that we have. Um, and he, you know, loses track of the, of the statement. It kind of gets away from him. But welcome to how he writes. Um, this is a, the type of Greek that makes people think that Paul wrote quite quickly. He would write, of course, through an amanuensis, but he would, of course, have final edit, editorial uh, direction. He would, he would look it over before it was sent out and copied and sent to the churches. So um, this was, it may have been chosen, Paul may have dictated this, but it was through, the, through an amanuensis who is, now, um, who is now anonymous. We don't know who this is. We know from Romans 16 that Tertius was one of Paul, Paul's amanuenses, but we don't know who the amanuensis is of, 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 of Ephesians, okay? But it makes glorious sense uh, to to gather, to katalabestai, um, from katalambano, uh, comprehendo, comprehend is, is the idea. It's a mental comprehension with all of the saints. That is the full church, uh, not just an isolated part. What is the, the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? And there, it's, it's like space itself. It's expansive and can't run out. And then, and to know. See this te here? Well, this is a, what you would call a uh, enclitic, and it links this idea, noni, which is kind of like this kat oikesi here, prolate, and to know. Now, now we have a very long, cumbersome phrase um, you got to take some liberties with this, but it's glorious. It's not that hard, really. That you may know the, and then you have tain huperbalusan, a participle, a feminine singular, um, accusative, and that is, of course, modifying agapain. So it's got to be that you may know the surpassing love of Christ, or, and then you're going to have to re redo this. The love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. That's how this genitive is in there. So this is a very loose genitive here um, that is surpassing knowledge. That you can't get to the bottom. You can't know this too well. There's always more where that came from is the idea here that Paul is doing. And then he ends this gloriously with still another henna. Uh, the third one right here in a series. Uh, Hina pleirotheta espanto pleroma to the u, that ye may be, be filled to the entire fullness of God. So you have this idea of, of fulsomeness, of being filled, of, of not being spare or niggardly, if you'll excuse that word. My wife doesn't like it when I use that word. But there's no um, running out. There's always more grace in Christ Jesus than we are even aware of. And again, this is another pitch for Greek. If you can handle the Greek and you can see what the words mean and where else they occur, you can unpack this. Uh, uh, I, I just about said on the spot. Don't do it on the spot. You know, write the sermon out so that you get it all and deliver it. Uh, in that way. Um, so, oh, oh, I see my, my markings went away. That's okay. And to know the, uh, s the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. Okay, gnosis. And remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 through 3, Paul develops this idea of knowledge and how important it is to know Christ. But here, the love of Christ trumps our knowledge. It's a great idea, okay, that, that you have here. And then we have this, this henna, which may be a reflection upon which has been mentioned, or it could go back up here to the, uh, to the uh, indirect command or the just of noun clause that ye may be filled toward the entire fullness of God. Now, 
having said all of that, um, the lexic the lexic the lexicographers um, couldn't resist putting in this last two verse uh, doxology. This is called the doxology, and they're they're quite common and frequent in Paul, um, and it's wonderful, wonderful stuff. You could even preach a sermon on this. To de dunomeno hyper panta poesai hupere perisiu hon itumetha e numen naumen. Okay, but to him who is able, uh, beyond, um, but to him who is able, yeah, okay, so this dunomeno is going to go with this. This infinitive here, to able to do beyond all things, uh, hyper excessively, hyper ek perisu. You have a double. Uh, this is an adverb, but you have a double um, compound here. You have hyper and you have ek, and perisu would be enough. But he doubles it. He makes it really, really powerful. He who is able to do beyond all things most superaboundingly um, than which, I would take this hone here as an ablatival genitive of separation, we ask or know, okay? Beyond what we ask or know. Um, God does way beyond what we are even able to express in our in our desperate need up for him, um, he, that God, um, in accordance with the power that is at work in us. He doesn't say in you, but in us. And that would, of course, be uh, according to word and sacrament, the gospel, baptism, the great gifts of the Spirit. That's what Paul has in mind. To him, Paul says in verse 21, be the glory in te ecclesia kai in Christo Jesu, in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all the generations of forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> okay? So this is a very fulsome uh, doxology. This has the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Most of the doxologies just say, the glory in Christ. But no, in Ephesians, he has to have the glory in the church in Christ Jesus uh, unto the generations, okay? All of the generations um, of the age of the ages is what it says literally, but we would say forever and ever, amen. And having said that, I'm going to say my amen and just charge in here and, and preach this to the joy and edification of Christ's holy people. Thank you.